Hey guys, what is up? Steven here. Wanted to take a minute and introduce our show today. Uh, we've got a really fun episode ahead for you, talking all things related to the Gabe Jackson cutting, Kyle Rudolph cutting, how those could impact the Chargers, and of course, uh, talking some free agency and different strategies that the Chargers could uh, attack in the next couple of weeks. We also have an interview with USC defensive tackle Marlon Tuipolotu. Really excited about that. Cannot thank him enough for the time that he took to interview with me. Uh, really excited about his potential in the NFL. And I hope you guys enjoy it. As always, make sure and leave us a, re a rating or, or a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And make sure and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. All right, guys, here's Marlon. Take a listen. Hey guys, welcome back to the Guilty as Charged podcast. I'm so happy to be joined now by USC defensive tackle Marlon Tuipolotu Jr. Marlon, thanks for joining us today. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, man, super excited to have you on here. Um, I know that you know you just barely came. Well, not just barely. It's been a few weeks now. Um, you had the opportunity to spend a week in Mobile at the Senior Bowl. Uh, what was that experience like for you? And uh, what were some some takeaways that that you had from that week? Yeah, I had a I had a great experience at the Senior Bowl. Um, first off, thank Jim Nagy for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> I uh, it was just a a week for me to just go out there and uh, show show scouts and and uh, show scouts like what I'm capable of. Um, just trying to show my strengths and then weaknesses that I have did have. Just try to go out there and and, and show that I that I've progressed and then. Uh, with the team, just trying to go out there and uh, just be a sponge, just trying to learn from a from an NFL coaching staff. So I was just trying to be a sponge and then just soak everything in, pretty much. What was you mentioned the weaknesses that you you thought you had going in? What was something or a, a piece of coaching that you took away, something to work on leading up to the draft? Yeah, uh, I mean, for the the short period of time that I had, I was just trying to just show that I can't that I'm able to rush the passer like I'm not just a two down player that I can be a three down player just I just need to continue to just keep working at it and, and continue to just learn from uh whichever coaches uh help me absolutely I think that's I think that's super important obviously you know the, the senior bowl is always important but you know just with everything that happened this year because of COVID I think it was a great opportunity for you guys um was there someone that gave you a little more trouble than someone else or someone that you were really excited to go up against in one-on-ones or, or in any kind of other practice scenario? I mean, I was just trying to go out there and just compete, uh, just show show people that I'm a competitor. <clears throat> um, there was a few good linemen there, but uh, David Moore from Grambling State, I felt like he was a pretty good offensive lineman. Um, but yeah, everyone was good there, just trying to showcase my, my abilities. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, there's a lot of uh, good talent there. But, you know, David Moore, I think that's an interesting one that not a lot of people are going to be familiar with. Um, you know, if our listeners are, are a little unfamiliar with you, how would you describe your game as, as a defensive tackle and maybe uh, some guys in the NFL that you compare yourself to? Uh, for your viewers, I just want to let them know that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a solid run defender. Uh, when it comes to the run, I'm able to stop the run efficiently, and then uh, uh, also showing my capabilities like that I can't get to the quarterback. Um, I'm a uh, I like to get to the football no matter where it's at, whether it's on the line of scrimmage or down the field. I'm, I'm a like I'm a I'm a high motor guy, um, and guys I like to watch is pretty much the Ron Payne from <coughs> Washington football team, and then I like watching Geno Atkins, uh, just because of their like his quickness and yeah explosiveness and his hustle to the football. Like that's something I take pride in. Geno's a great one, man. I think any defensive tackle would be smart to watch him just because. He's been doing it at such a high level for such a long time. Um, you know, I, I think everybody, obviously everybody was impacted by COVID, but the Pac-12 in general, you know, my alma mater, Utah, they get, they had two games canceled. You guys had one game canceled. You're supposed to play Washington in the championship game. Ended up playing Oregon because Washington couldn't feel a team. How tough was that? And like, what kind of lessons were you able to take from, you know, having such an, such an high impacted by COVID season? Right. I mean, it, it was it sucked to have COVID, but we just got to continue to just work through it. Um, 
like you said, we missed the game, but for the most part, we were pretty disciplined to continue to just uh, keep our distance, like whether it was with each other, but even with the outside world, world, I guess. So we were in our own little bubble, just trying to stay disciplined and so we can be able to continue to play these football games. And luckily, we only missed one game compared to everyone else. So I felt like we did a, a great job of handling the COVID situation. Yeah, it was it was such a tough situation for everybody to be in. And, you know, for the Pac-12 to even finish the season, I think is pretty admirable. So uh, when you look back at your time on USC, do you have a favorite moment or like one of your, your favorite plays that you were able to make uh, during your time as a Trojan? Um, I feel like uh, uh, like the plays I like uh, showing is the plays, the hustle plays that I've had, like whether it's on the screen play, like being able to di diagnose the screen and being able to hustle down to the to to make the the play against the screen. And then it's funny you said you you went to Utah, but one of my yeah. favorite plays was uh, having a uh, a sack cause fumble against against our team. So that was, that was pretty exciting. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Utah and USC have had, had some fun battles. Uh, obviously, you know, you guys have been able to get the best of the Utes a couple times back to back years. But uh, I do remember the play you're talking about. And that was uh, it was a hell of a play, man. Um, in terms of like, you know, what, what can you tell people about what you were asked to do as a defensive tackle? And how do you think that uh, your responsibilities could be expanded upon in the NFL? Yeah, so pretty much at USC it was just taking up blocks, like uh, taking the double teams, and then whenever I could, just make the plays through the double teams. Like especially being a nose tackle, um, we're gonna get double teams a lot. So just being able to to carry those double teams for linebackers to fill in the gaps, the open gaps, and make plays, and then also just continue to make the plays that I I know I can make. So that's pretty much pretty much it. Yeah, you know, I think the defensive tackle is definitely a position that's continuing to evolve in the NFL because of guys like Aaron Donald and Chris Jones. And, you know, you mentioned Geno Atkins. Um, you know, you, you had a great chance to play against some NFL offensive linemen every single day in practice. Obviously, Austin Jackson was a tackle. Elijah Vera Tucker, you know, both guys going in the first round potentially. Um, what was it like practicing against them and uh, practicing against them every day? And what kind of lessons were you able to take from those practices? Uh, for me, it was just I had to show up every day at practice. Um, going against those guys, like those are top tier guys. So I know if I went against them, I knew I was getting myself better. So just continue to go in there, play with good technique, try to play with good technique. And I know I was going to, I was just trying to take the, make the most out of going uh, against with those opportunities, going against those guys. That's fantastic, man. I, I think really, you know, in the NFL, it's so important to be able to have that kind of competitive mindset uh, every day in practice. So uh, last one for me here, Marlon, um, you know, I don't want to say like convincing, but like, why do you think teams should take a chance on you in the NFL and what kind of, uh, mentality and, and traits are you going to take to, to the team that, uh, ultimately picks you? Yeah. I like to just say that I'm a hard nosed football player. Um, I'm able to do the dirty work. Uh, like I said before, I'm a, a pretty solid, uh, run defender, uh, stop the run. And then also being able to showcase my abilities as a, a third down, a third down pass rusher. Um, just when given the opportunity. So like what y'all gonna get out of me is I'm gonna just give it my all every play pretty much. I love that answer, man. And being a three down run defender and being able to rest the passer is so important. So, um, you know, I wish you nothing but the best. Um, you know, it's unfortunate my youth's gonna beat you a couple of times, but you know, ultimately you're, you're an NFL prospect now. And so I, wherever you land, man, I hope you have a, a very successful NFL career and I wish you nothing but the best going forward. I guess I appreciate it, Mr. Hagen. Hey, Chargers fans, welcome into another episode of the Guilty is Charged podcast. We got a little mixing it up today. Uh, last time was just me and Tyler. Today, it's me and Alex. Uh, I want to give a happy birthday shout out to uh, John Shun, Tyler's dad. Uh, that is the reason why Tyler's not here to join us. So happy birthday, John Shun. Uh, we wish you nothing but the best. Alex, how are you doing today, dude? Pretty good. Uh, it's sad for John Shun that they cut uh, Gabe Jackson on his birthday and they might be trading <laughs> Chad Brown, but... Uh, yeah. You know, uh, happy birthday to him, and I hope Tyler's having fun with him today. But uh, uh, good news today, I didn't fall asleep before the show, um, and so that's why I wasn't on the show last time. But uh, yeah, I so to give you a little background on that, uh, 
at like 7 30 eastern i was like trying to splash water on my face to see if i could stay awake <laughs> and i was basically like <laughs> waterboarding myself to try to like stay away from the show i fell asleep and woke up at 11 p.m anyway and i'm like shit they already started uh but anyway <laughs> i'm back that time zone that the time zone differences can get us man sometimes yeah. so it's all good man you're here today and that's what matters so uh, you mentioned Gabe Jackson. That's kind of going to be our co- our conversation, uh, our topic of conversation today. Um, you know, Diana Rossini has really been on top of things. And this morning she sent out a tweet that she was talking to a head coach about, you know, next week uh, and, you know, that it's going to be a massacre was her exact words. And we, we've already seen that happen today. You know, Kyle Rudolph was released. Gabe Jackson was released. All these players are getting released. Um, the Saints released Jared Cook and uh, I think it's Josh Hill. So, you know, these, these veterans, there's going to be a, a ton of movement around. And, and basically what she's referring to is that the cap number is going to be finalized next uh, later on this week, hopefully by uh, Friday afternoon, I think is the hope. And so there's going to be a lot of players cut and, and it's just going to be, you know, a free for all. And thankfully the chargers uh, have a path to being able to take on some of that some of those veteran players because they can make one or two cuts and get around $50 million in cap space. Yeah. Um, they can make one of the two of those cuts. Right. Uh, but like Ian Rappaport was saying, I think on Pat McAfee's show, he was like, Hey, you know, they don't know whether the cap is going to be 180. Is it going to be 187, 190? Like they don't know. I mean, they've set 180 as the floor and like, that's a pretty big difference. You know, yeah. when you're talking about some of these guys, like, you know, we think Trey Turner is probably going to get cut anyway, But seven million dollars, you know, you go to the Chargers salary cap table, uh, you know, you can cut Linval Joseph for and save seven million. You know, if that's that could be something that's under consideration. If the difference in the salary cap, uh, if the salary cap is only 180, then you might may have to make that cut. If the salary cap is 187, you might not have to, right? Or it could be the difference between signing one offensive lineman in free agency or two, or signing another star player, right? Um, so it's a big deal. And, and the two names that I mentioned today, when, when I heard of the term massacre, uh, really sounded like, you know, Casey Hayward and Linval Joseph to me on this team, if they're really going to cut a lot. Now, I think the Chargers are in a better position than, you know, the Raiders and a lot of these other teams because yeah. they are doing better in the salary cap because uh, they have a rookie quarterback that they're not paying. But uh, so I, I think that they'll be fine. But, you know, you know, it, it really depends on what they want to do in free agency as well. And we have really no idea. Like we've heard them linked to certain guys, but there's no real clear on how big they want to go uh, spending wise. So if you want to go after <laughs> Leonard Floyd and Joe Thune or something like that, that's a lot more complicated than if you want to spend less. So I think that'll determine, you know, uh, which guys the Chargers cut and uh, which guys get cut around the league as a whole. Yeah, so we should be we should be hearing about whether or not the Chargers are cutting people, you know, before the end of next week, I would assume, because that's going to, you know, determine how big they can go in free agency. And, you know, really, it's just all about making sacrifices. You know, if you want to really upgrade the offensive line, you probably have to cut Trey Turner. You know, the Arizona Cardinals, they have needed a pass rush compliment next to Chandler Jones, who can get after it every single week. And, you know, they signed J.J. Watt and they're going to have to make sacrifices. And so, you know, could J.J. Watt make them a contender? I don't really know, but I think that's a a big step in the right direction for their defense because, you know, they have needed a consistent complimentary pass rusher for really ever since Chandler Jones has been there. And so the Chargers are going to be in similar situations on the offensive line in the secondary. Do you really want to be aggressive? You're going to have to make sacrifices if you want to run it back then you can do that. But I think it, you know, you're in such a good position to, you know, make a, a, a few simple cuts and you could get, you know, realistically three or four new starters that are, and really upgrade your talent in the secondary and the pass rush and on the offensive line. So, you know, how much are you willing to sacrifice this roster that won seven games last year? And, and you know, how much are you wanting to shape it in Brandon Staley's image. That's really what it's going to come down to for Tom Telesco in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. And as we saw with uh, Kyle Van Noy this week, all, all of these four year, three year contracts that are going to be given out, uh, not a ton of them are too permanent. Um, yeah. And you can get off of them uh, pretty simply in some situations. So uh, we'll see how that all plays out. The JJ Watt thing was interesting. I know a lot of Chargers fans wanted to go after JJ Watt, but 
while I like him as a pass rusher and I think he's a great pickup for Arizona, I just wasn't of the mindset of like getting a pass rusher that's that old, you know, in his 30s yeah. and has also had those season ending injuries. That was my main concern. Um, <laughs> and the Cardinals gave him 15 million and that was apparently on the low end compared to what other teams wanted to give him, which was yeah. like basically 17 or 18 million probably from Buffalo or Cleveland or Green Bay. Um, so I think they probably made the right decision by not getting in on that. But, you know, it, the idea of Watt and Bosa <laughs> would be ridiculously fun. Absolutely. I just don't think it was feasible. And I, I think if they really want to go after a pass rusher uh, in free agency that's pricey, I think it'll be one of the two uh, Leonard's, uh, Floyd or Williams in that instance. Yeah, you know, really, like, that's the thing about the Chargers defense is that it needs to get younger and it needs to get more athletic. And so... You know, I, I was talking with Jason Reed, uh, you know, our editor at Boltbeat, and he was saying like, oh, I wouldn't be too surprised if Melvin Ingram is back. I just think, you know, if you're looking at what really, you know, if you watched Brandon Staley's Rams defense and even on the Broncos before that, it's all about like versatility, like versatility is the theme of that defense. And so could Melvin Ingram come back on a, on a one year deal? Like, sure, that's possible. But to me, you know, they're going to look to add people who can play multiple roles because that's what they, you know, that's what they are going to figure out what they want to do with Joey Bosa and being able to seek out mismatches. And they're going to need somebody to do not obviously not at the same scale, but similar things who can, you know, rush the inside and rush the outside in, in terms of targeting a secondary playmaker. They're going to want somebody that can cover in the slot, play the safety or do the slot and play outside. And so, that really is the theme of the defense to me. And that's why I think Leonard Floyd, it makes a lot of sense because he can do a lot of those things. He can rush outside. He can rush inside. Um, I'm, I'm not, honestly, I'm not super sure about Hassan Reddick's future in Arizona and, and how that would potentially fit in Los Angeles. But, you know, that's another one. You mentioned Leonard Williams. I mean, Leonard Williams can do pretty much the same exact stuff that Joey Bosa can do. He had a monster season for the Giants this year and could do inside, outside, rush from the nose if that they want him to rush from the three technique rush from out wide so really I, I think if you're targeting defensive free agents it's got to be people who are versatile and, and bring youth to the table as well as that versatility yeah I mean I, I wouldn't be shocked if Melvin Ingram came back on a, on a one-year prove-it deal and then cap goes up next year and that puts him into circulation uh, with more money in free agency and you know, I think if he was healthy next year, he would get more than zero sacks yeah. uh, that he got this year for sure. But yeah, I, I just, I think if they kept Bradley and they kept Lynn uh, and they really ran this back, then I think Ingram would have a much larger chance of, of being back on the team, but because they didn't, it just didn't, doesn't make a lot of sense to bring Melvin Ingram back um, as not as much sense as it made maybe a year ago. Yeah, I think that's true. And, and, I, I don't know how much of a market Melvin is going to have, honestly, coming off of last season, but, you know, he's still got that reputation of being a dominant pass rusher. So, you know, I could see if they're able to clear enough space, you know, the Raiders need a pass rusher and obviously their connection there with Gus Bradley is legit. Obviously Anthony Lynn and Detroit could, could sway them to potentially pursuing him. They have some good cap space. The Jets have... <laughs> like close to 90 million dollars in cap space and so do the jaguars and so i could see like a, a rebuilding team like the jets or the jaguars saying hey you know what melvin ingram like we'll pay you you know a two-year 40 million dollar deal and, and you know you can come play your last two years here with us and, and we'll pay you a shit ton of money to do so so i don't know man i, I don't think the chargers can take that chance i think to me you're either going to trust Uchenna and Wosu to take that step under Brandon Staley and draft somebody, or you're going to sign, you know, a Leonard Floyd or a Leonard Williams uh, and then use Uchenna and Wosu in, in a similar, similar role to what he was being used last year. Yeah. And uh, the other name that has been circulating this week, because <laughs> Bradley put him in his article, uh, Bradley Williams over at the draft network uh, was Bud Dupree, uh, yeah. which I thought was an interesting name if they want to go after him, because he's probably not going to be back in Pittsburgh because <laughs> eventually they have zero money. Yeah, they have zero money. And eventually they <laughs> have to pay uh, TJ Watt. So, you know, he's going to go somewhere else. So that would be an intriguing uh, Dupree and uh, Bosa pairing. It would, man. Bud Dupree is an awesome pass rusher. And I think, you know, like normally I'm not the kind of 
person to be like, oh, so and so is going to be cut or so and so is not back. Like, oh, sign me up for the Chargers. But like, you know, the Chargers are really sitting pretty in, in terms of cap space. And we mentioned, you know, the simple cuts that they could make. You know, teams like the Raiders and the Saints and, and the Steelers, like they've got to cut people and do nothing else just to get under the cap. I know you can manipulate things a certain way because the cap is mostly a myth, but you still have to get under the cap for this year. And so, other teams are just going to be stuck with what they have in the draft. And if you're a Raiders fan, like that's a scary, that's a scary thought, man. Trusting Mike Mayock and John Gruden to upgrade the roster through the draft. Uh, that's a, that's a not comforting thought if I'm a Raiders fan. Well, see the Raiders, they, they have a very big strength in the draft and that's nailing first round pick running backs. They can do that <laughs> very effectively. It's all of the other picks in the draft that they're not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they draft, if they're getting a running back, they're solid. Otherwise it's, it's not. So, you know, uh, let, let's talk about Gabe Jackson now because, you know, Gabe Jackson, uh, obviously, you know, a cap casualty. He's been on the Raiders since 2013, I believe. Um, and he's been a very solid player, you know, in, like towards the end of his rookie deal and the, the the first two years of his second deal, he was one of the best guards in football and, and he's not that anymore, but he's still very solid. And if you filter on pro football focus guards by who uh, took 80% of the snaps or, or higher, you know, he was 11th in fewest pressures given up Forrest lamp all the way down at uh, 25. So, you know, it's a sizable upgrade. It's not, you know, as big as going up from, you know, a Forest Lamp to a Joe Thune. But, you know, Gabe Jackson would represent an upgrade on the offensive line for the Chargers. Yeah, um, I mean, he, he also played all 16 games too, right? Yeah. And that's a, a, another thing is health. And that's been true with Turner. It's been true with Balaga. Just haven't, they weren't able to stay healthy last year. Um, so just a couple numbers. So Gabe Jackson had zero sacks allowed, 26 uh, total pressures on 1,062 snaps last year, on 536 snaps last year, uh, just basically half, you had uh, Trey Turner allowing one sack and 19 pressures. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a sizable upgrade, I think, um, just in terms of someone who, even though they're about the same age, I think Gabe Jackson, you could give him a two-year deal and see what he does. Um, you know, and also that's another thing. Turner's do eleven and a half million, and the Raiders just cut uh, Gabe Jackson, making about nine and a half. Yeah. Right. So that's just you know, if you're working within the margins there, you can basically get a better player right now for cheaper. Yeah, and you know, like he, again, he's very solid. You know, he's had some injuries uh in the past couple years uh not 2020 but he was hurt a little bit in 2019 and 2018 but you know if you just pull up his pro football focus profile man it's 26 pressures this year 15 the year before 23 22 26 23 19 i know pro football focus grades are not always you know you got to take them with a grain of salt but right you know he's been in the high 70s a few times 73 in 2018 74 79 uh, he's been 63 and 61 the last two years. And as a pass blocker, you know, he's been very, very solid in the seventies, each of every single year of his career. And so if you look at that compared to what the chargers have had really in the last decade, like he would be their best offensive lineman outside of maybe Russell Okun's 2018 season. So I think Gabe Jackson would make a lot of sense. Obviously there's a connection there with Frank Smith, the chargers offensive line coach, who was the tight ends coach and run game coordinator in las vegas so it it checks a lot of boxes you know there are a few guys out there who will check some boxes you know we've talked about Corey lindsley a bunch but gabe jackson certainly checks a lot of bunches and uh john feliciano his former teammate seemed to apply that gabe was not happy in las vegas and so i would think the appeal of playing the raiders twice a year making good money playing for a legitimate franchise quarterback who just had the best rookie season of all time I think that would make a lot of sense for both sides. Honestly, I do. Yeah. Um, and I just selfish plug, but I wrote a offensive line grades article uh, <laughs> recently where I graded every single offensive lineman on the chargers in 2020 and man, zero sacks and 26 pressures would be the best offensive <laughs> on this team no. uh, by far, you know, just uh, some eye popping numbers there. If you want to look at uh, PFF or pro football reference and, and see just the stats from a, future 2020 offensive line but um yeah no I, I think a jackson is kind of a no-brainer if they really want to go after it 
I think he would be an improvement over Trey Turner. And, you know, you basically save money by going out and getting him. Um, that's to me, just, it just makes a lot of sense. And I know you can bet on Trey Turner to have a better year and all that, but unless he really wants to seriously restructure, uh, I yeah. just can't see bringing him back uh, being a reality. No, like you could give it, you could give Turner a, like a one-year extension similar to what Denzel Perryman got and be like, listen, like, you know, we'll, we'll restructure everything. We'll heavily incentivize it for this upcoming year. If you play, you know, 14 games, you know, we'll, we'll fulfill your salary and, and push some guaranteed money for turn net towards next year. But even then, like, I honestly, they just need a fresh start from the offensive line perspective. They can't cut Brian Bulaga because he's got such a massive dead cap hit, but, you know, realistically with where they're sitting in the cap, they could get a Corey Lindsley. They could get, uh, Gabe Jackson or a John Feliciano or Larry Warford and, and then, you know, draft a couple of linemen in the off in, in April and you have a big time upgrade on the offensive line. And so they'll probably have one cheapish signing that they'll be able to bring in for depth and for competition. I think Kelvin Beecham makes a lot of sense there or a Nick Easton from the saints. Um, but they could realistically get, you know, first round pick two really nice veteran signings. And, you know, we're talking about a completely different unit in 2021. Yeah, um, we're probably going to say all this and then they're going to re-sign <laughs> Tevi and Lamb <laughs> and just run it back. Yeah. Uh, but, you yeah, know, I mean, I, I really hope they do uh, make some changes. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind re-signing like a Tevi or Lamb to be like a depth oh, tackle yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you want to do that. Uh, but, yeah, like I think Beecham is a great buy low option. You could probably get him for like a little less than five million and he can either be your starting tackle or if you go out and draft Christian Darrisaw or Elijah Vera Tucker, you know, he can be your backup then. Like I think that that works out pretty well. Uh, so we'll see what happens, but I, uh, I think they're in a position where they can make serious moves on the offensive line uh, if they choose. And I guess we'll figure out in a week if they really uh, want to fix this offensive line. Yeah. You know, like they'll, they will have options and Kelvin Beecham, like, a, a potential signing of Kelvin Beecham, like those are signings that, you know, make or break your season. Like, you know, we saw how much Nick Vigil helped this team in, in spot duty. And that was a huge thing for them. You know, Limbaugh Joseph wasn't the flashiest signing of last year. Obviously that would probably go towards Chris Harris and Brian Belaga, but Limbaugh Joseph was the best free agent edition of the year. So, you know, Kelvin Beecham again, you know, he's, he was a very good player for the Jets um and then last year for the for the cardinals they signed him for a super cheap deal um they were hoping that they were able to uh, potentially start josh jones and instead he wasn't ready so they went towards kelvin beecham and he had a fantastic year he played in all 16 games again a thousand snaps at right tackle and he gave them a 76 pass blocking grade 69 offensive grade and 25 pressures allowed which again, would by far be the best offensive lineman <laughs> on the Chargers. So, you know, they'll get a low-key free agent signing, I think, uh, that could, you know, like you mentioned, you know, if you draft Chris and Darisaw, you bring Kelvin Beecham in as a veteran swing tackle, which should be a no-brainer. You know, what's the alternative? Having Trey Pipkins as a swing tackle? Like, I'm going to take a hard <laughs> pass on that one. So, um, you know, I think if they want to really invest in the offensive line, they have the resources to do it. It's just a matter of going out and doing it. And I think Brandon Staley will, you know, kind of push Tom Telesco towards upgrading at least two or three spots. I don't know. Like you said, Dan Feeney could be back. Forrest Slam could be back. Um, Sam Tevy could be back at one of those starting spots. But, you know, I think we'll get at least three new starting offensive linemen in 2021. Uh, yeah, I hope so. And, uh, yeah, you know, Speaking of Trey Pipkins, I mean, they have a better backup swing tackle on the roster uh, with uh, Storm Norton. Yeah. He played 150 snaps, I, I believe it. No, he played 135 snaps, I think, at left tackle, and then 170 at right. And he was really good. <laughs> like, uh, he had, I think, the best overall blocking grade on the Chargers. Granted, he didn't play uh, you know, more than 300 snaps, but you know, that's something to take note of, you know, going forward next year, deciding, hey, you know, if Balaga has to come out of a game or the left tackle has to come out of a game, who are we putting in? I, I think Storm Norton deserves uh, a look certainly over someone like Trey Pipkins based on his 2020 season. 
Yeah, and it's the same situation with Cole Toner, man. Cole Toner right. was the sixth player to take snaps at right guard and was the best of the bunch. So, <laughs> you know, it's just a, a sad state of affairs. But I, I do feel confident that they will upgrade the position group. It's just a matter of who they choose to do it. Um, so really the other big free agency the thing that we, we've talked a bunch about Hunter Henry, you know, we think that they should resign him, but there are some more intriguing options, not more intriguing than Hunter Henry more than there were, I guess is what I'm saying, because Kyle Rudolph was released today. Delaney Walker, uh, decided to potentially make a comeback and David Njoku is potentially going to be cut. So, um, they've got a, a few more options if they do miss out on Hunter Henry, um, so Alex, what do you think the argument is going on in the chargers front office about not keeping Hunter Henry around? And, and what would you make of that argument? I mean, I think the argument for not keeping him around is just, you would have to kind of sign him to a, re- a long, you know, a long-term extension four years. Right. And probably pay him like, you know, the third best tight end in the league, right. Around 12 million per year. Um, and, you know, can you rely on someone who's been as injured as he has been, right? You know, he did play a full season in, in 2020, COVID aside, but, you know, yeah. he did have, you know, the ACL, he did have the tibia fracture uh, last year. So, you, you, you know, you add all those things together and it's just like he hadn't been able to stay healthy. So if you want to go to a lower risk option and just be like, hey, we're going to go get a guy like, Kyle Rudolph for Zach Ertz or one of those guys where, okay, you maybe have to extend him, but it's probably not going to be as expensive as a Hunter Henry extension because those guys are a little bit yeah. older. You know, that might be the argument for it. Um, I don't know if they're going to go quite as old as Delaney Walker. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, you know, that dude is, is old, but um, and Joku is also another option. I think we talked about uh, and Joku last summer when there was kind of rumors that, you know, Cleveland would trade him and it was like, yeah. you know, maybe he could be a backup tight end. You know, I, I don't know if I would buy in Joku as a full time starter. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to do an upgrade over, you know, Steven Anderson, maybe like, you, you know, you want to get a Joku and I wouldn't view um, in Joku as a Hunter Henry replacement personally just because uh, I still think he does have some problems in his game, although he was better this year. Um, yeah. You know, the Browns wanted to replace him with, <laughs> with Austin Hooper. So, uh, you know, you take that for what it is. But um, no, I, I think there's definitely an argument to be made for not keeping Henry. The only thing is, is like, okay, you might save a little bit of money here and there, but yeah. Zach Ertz is four years older, right? Um, Kyle Rudolph is definitely older. Delaney Walker, a lot older. <laughs> Uh, and that's just kind of how it boils down. Now, I'm not against Zach Ertz. If, you know, uh, Hunter Henry wants to leave and go somewhere else, if he wants to go to New England, fine. You know, you're not, I don't think they're going to franchise tag him again uh, based on everything we've heard. So, you know, I just think at that point, you know, you go to the backup option, and I think there's absolutely better backup options now than there was two yeah. weeks ago uh, because we were trying to, talk up Gerald Everett and <laughs> guys like that. Um, so there's definitely better options now, but I still think at the end of the day, you do really have to resign Hunter Henry just because, you know, he's a guy in your system. It's sort of a taking care of your guys move. And he's ultimately a lot younger than these tight ends and has some more potential to grow. Yeah. You know, I, I like, I still think that they uh, should resign Hunter Henry, you know, for me, it's just how well-rounded he is. You know, we saw him take a big step forward as a blocker this year. And, you know, even though he's not like the most athletic yards after catch kind of guy, he's very dependable target over the middle in the corners of the end zone. And that's what the Chargers need with Justin Herbert. They need to keep some continuity around him. And so, you know, you're looking at replacing a coaching staff, a brand new offensive line for Justin Herbert. For me, it makes sense to keep the skill position, the skill supporting cast as much intact as possible, you know, maybe adding a receiver in the draft or something like that. But if they do miss out on him, if he gets an offer he can't refuse from New England or from Jacksonville, who has a lot of money again, or the Jets, um, you know, and they lose out on the, the two options for me, they can be broken down in towards, you know, you're getting a decrease in, in, potential but you're potentially getting a younger more athletic tight end whether whether that's Gerald Everett or David Njoku where you're getting a less productive but you know less injury prone potential with a veteran whether that's Zach Ertz or Kyle Rudolph and so or Delaney Walker 
Um, so they have options now if they don't want to pursue this, if they want to take that potential, you know, 11, $12 million and use it on Joe Thune or, or whoever the case may be on the offensive line or John Johnson or Leonard Floyd on defense. Like they have the options. They have the flexibility to do so because there are other decent options out there. I, I still think that the ja- the draft is not, not a likely target because it's just not a very good tight end class unless you're wanting to take like a dart throw as a potential backup. But in terms of finding a starter, they have two choices, younger, less productive, but more athletic or older, less productive, but doesn't come with the injury history. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's why you would probably take a guy over Henry. Um, I, I ultimately do think they'll reach a deal with Hunter Henry, but if they don't, uh, I, I definitely agree that the options now are much better than the options that they had two weeks ago, just in terms of all the yeah. movement and everyone that's on the table. Um, so, you know, I trust Tom Telesco to get it right to some extent when it comes to the tight ends. You know, if it doesn't work down with Henry, they have some options. So uh, I'm totally cool with whatever direction they decide to go. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what they decide to do with Hunter Henry. Um you know, other than, you know, not resigning him, I think, you know, Fernando Ramirez put out this article and he felt like that uh, Michael Davis was the most likely free agent to be resigned. And I kind of agree with that. And so I think outside of him, I don't know if there's a true must resign because you could make an argument for Hunter Henry, you know, being too expensive. And so it's gonna be interesting to see what they do uh, on that front in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I don't know if there's a must resign out of those two. Um, I think you look at like Denzel Perriman and Nick Vigil. Those guys aren't going to be like super expensive, but they did play really well last year, right? So for me, if you can get both of those guys back for about the same prices they played in 2020, uh, I think that that's really a great decision just from both a leadership standpoint and the fact that, you know, when uh, Nick Vigil went down and, uh, or sorry, no, when, uh, Drew Tranquil went down, they played bigger roles and they, yeah. uh, they helped out a lot. It's going to be, that's an interesting one to bring up because the linebacker position, again, like you've got to be a versatile defensive player to play under Brandon Staley. And so, you know, how does that affect a Denzel Perryman, who's a specialist who really, it, although he improved as a, in coverage situations, you know, his specialty right. is just being, you know, a, a bull in a China shop as a linebacker and just going to hit people but he apparently said on Instagram that he wants to be back. He wants to stay with the Chargers, which makes a lot of sense. You know, you get in routine, you get comfortable with in a situation and you want to stay around. And so um, Nick Vigil will not be expensive and he was, you know, decent on special teams. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know how good he was as a special <laughs> teams player. But, you know, in, in terms of being like a fourth linebacker on the team or fifth linebacker on the team, like Nick Vigil is a solid option. Yeah, and I mean, Nick Vigil's uh, ability is to explode the hamstrings of Raiders quarterbacks uh, (laughs) and push them out of bounds. Uh, So, you know, that's an ability that's uh, underrated. But I I thought Nick Vigil was really great this year, um, just in terms of the role he did. And if you can resign him for one year, two million, what you gave him last year, um, I think that's a really uh, great move. All the other free agents that the Chargers have kind of depend on, like, do they really want to make big moves like another guy's Ray Sean Jenkins, right? But do they want to make a yeah. move with John Johnson, right? And then if you sign John Johnson, that kind of completely takes, I don't, I don't want to say completely takes, but it would really just eliminate the point of re signing Ray Sean Jenkins or, or someone like that. So um, I think that that's a question that they'll need to answer. A lot of the other guys are like Damian Square, who again wouldn't mind having back as a rotation piece if they want to do that. Uh, and then the linemen, right? That's Forrest Lamp, Dan Feeney, Sam Tevy. Um, I, I guess Steven Anderson is a restricted free agent. They'll probably get him yeah. back. Uh, the, the last big question that I think is interesting is uh, Michael Badgley is a restricted free agent. Yeah. Um, so that'll be interesting if they want to let him go and just start a completely new kicking competition, or if they're just going to bring him back uh, for his cost and uh, start a kicking competition that way. So that, that to me will be an interesting uh, domino to watch in free agency. Yeah. You know, they've got, uh, you know, defined connections through Darius Swinton to Zane, Zane Gonzalez, obviously Matt Prater, who he coached in Denver. Um, I want to say, oh wait, not the, the Colquitt brother is a punter. So, Never mind about that one, but um, <laughs> they've got 
some potential connections out there. And there are some decent options in the draft, potentially in a late round situation or, you know, an undrafted free agent kind of, kind of player. And so I think, you know, you bring Badgley back because, you know, how much of an upgrade is Zane Gonzalez or Matt Prater at this point in his career, Matt Prater is I think 38. Um, so, you know, you, you you bring back Michael Badgley and then you bring in an undrafted free agent for competition and, and you let it work itself out. You give Badgley a, you know, a one or two year deal and, and, you know, give him some incentives. And if he wins the competition battle, you can, you know, give him a bigger incentive extension if you want. So, you know, I think Badgley, he's very similar, similar in the, in the same camp as Trey Turner and Melvin Ingram. Will he be as bad as he was this year, next year? Probably not, but you know, can they find an upgrade? Like that's the question there uh, that they'll have to figure out. Yeah. The only reason I bring up Badgley is because, you know, if you've listened to Brandon Staley's press conferences, uh, if you listen to Darius Swinton speak a little bit, the thing that they keep harping on is the kicking game, the kicking game, the kicking game. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a constant reoccurring theme. So I'll just be, I'll just be curious to see what they do there. But um, yeah, I think the must resign free agents are really um I mean, honestly, you can make an argument that the real must resign is Michael Davis because they just don't have another guy who can do what he does. And I don't think you can draft another guy who can come in and, do, and you know, do what Michael Davis does with his skill set uh, and physical ability. Um, Hunter Henry, I think, is close to a must resign, right? Unless you really want to go all in on one of the um, backup options that we were talking about. But you know, I think that those are really it. And then we'll see where the other chips fall for their other free agents. You know, um, someone asked the Patreon question that we'll get to in our Friday live stream regarding uh, Tyrod Taylor, and we'll, whether he'll be back next year. Um, that'll be interesting. So um, stay tuned. Yeah, absolutely. Stay tuned for that. We're, we are going to do our live show and we uh, have explored a way to make sure that we get all three of us on there. So it should be fun. Um <laughs> But basically, you know, the, the cap number should be finalized in the next couple of days, which means that we should hopefully get some uh, actual actual news related to the Chargers next week, you know, with some cuts and things like that. Um, the other thing that uh, Albert Breer brought up today was, you know, the, uh, the Buffalo Bills have submitted a, a potential rule change, which would uh, which is going to be voted upon by the league, which would basically you know, force teams to wait to hire a new coach until after the Super Bowl. So obviously the Chargers um, would have been affected by this, you know, had this taken place next year because they they hired Brandon Staley. They were interviewing other candidates who were in late in uh, late postseason runs. And it's just an interesting idea. I want to get your thoughts on this first before I give mine. Um, do you think that this is a good rule? Do you think that this is something that the league will pass or just your initial reaction to the, the potential rule change? Um, I guess I don't really think it's a good rule or a bad rule. I just kind yeah. of feel neutral about it. Um, I guess the positive is right. Like you get, you know, a Brian Dable or someone who can take a more serious look at the coaching landscape, you know, after their team is done. Yeah. Um, but I also don't feel like the chargers, you know, <laughs> hired Brandon Staley because they were worried about, losing Brian Dable or Brian Dable would go to the Super Bowl and, you know, uh, win or something. And then they'd have to wait longer. Like, I think they realized, you know, at a certain point, Brandon Staley uh, was their guy and that's who they decided to go to despite feeding uh, misinformation to Schefter, I guess. (laughs) But I, um, I think that it's a decent rule change, you know, to give everyone a fair chance, but also it's like, I do think there is something to be said about like, you know, Brian Dable, if you, if you're making the AFC championship game and the NFC championship game or the Super Bowl, like your job's probably going to be okay. If you don't get a coaching job this year versus the guys that are out of jobs and are looking to get back into circulation, right. Yeah. You know, say Brian Dable or one of those guys wins the Super Bowl. Well, it's like, well, now they have an advantage over me. That's pretty significant uh, in terms of the hiring process. Yeah. Right. And then that can sway things. So, uh, I'm kind of neutral on it. If they really want to do it that way, that's fine. Um, but I, I do think sort of the, you know, I, I do think they did have an interview with Brian Dable. And I think if they really wanted to, they would have waited for Brian Dable anyway. Yeah. Um, and what was Brian Dable going to do if he won the Super Bowl? Would that have caused him to pick the Eagles or the Texans over the Chargers? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. So yeah. um, I'm kind of neutral on it. I see why it's a thing just because, 
yeah, it can be difficult to, you know, have an offensive or defensive coordinator whose mind is, you know, trying Absolutely. to balance the playoffs and their next job opportunity. Um, but, you know, I also think that there's, there's, there's positives and negatives to it. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. You know, I don't know how much, you know, a potential job out of here was, would potentially distract a candidate. Like, you know, Brandon Saley had two interviews the day after they lost the playoff game to the, uh, to the Packers. And it's like, okay, no one really knows how much that impacted him, but you know, if you don't have to worry about it at all, then you're, you know, purely focused on the, on the game. So I get that part of it. And look, like, you know, we looked at every single coach that had interviews that was in the, in the conference championship weekend and none of them got interviewed or none of them got hired. So you had Eric the and, and Brian Byron Leftwich and Todd Bowles and Brian Dable and all these guys who, are very well qualified. They didn't get hired. And could they have been punished for, you know, playing too long into the season? Like, you know, I guess, you know, that's, that's what teams have to decide. If, if the, like you said, if the Chargers wanted Dable, they would have waited. If Dable was their guy, they would have waited. And so it's up to each team to, to decide how long they can wait. Because if you fire your coach on, on Black Monday, you can get your, your coaching search started right away. If you right. have to wait until the Super Bowl, like, this is my thing, like team wise, you know, if you have your coach intact and you don't make the playoffs, your off season starts six to eight weeks earlier than a team who is going to fire their head coach and has to wait until after the Super Bowl to hire that head coach. And so will it make it a, it makes it a more evenly balanced table for the candidates, but like team wise, you know, you're losing out on two months essentially of your off season because you have to wait to hire your next coach. Right. Yeah. I, I think that that's my problem with it. Right. Is, you know, you, you start your off season, you know, you're in a bad place in an organization. Usually if you fire a coach yeah. <laughs> and you have to wait till the team's finished the Super Bowl to see, uh, you know, what you want to do next. Right. And then that kind of creates, I, I guess I've always viewed the coaching search as a little bit of parody too, which is like, yeah. okay, these teams can get started on finding their next guy before these playoff teams, you know, get themselves figured out. But if you're putting everyone on an equal playing field, then, well, you know, say the, some team loses a playoff game, uh, just to make up like a hypothetical example, not that this would happen. The Steelers lose some crucial playoff game or something, and they decide to fire Mike Tomlin, and they decide they want to get a new coach. Well, immediately, the Steelers or some other team that fires their coach after the postseason uh, becomes way more attractive <laughs> than some team that went 5-11 and 11 <laughs> or yeah. something like that, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's pros and cons to it. I'm not against the idea, but I also don't think it, it seems like this is, uh, sort of this idea came from the Brian Dable, uh, thing with the bills. And, uh, I don't think Brian Dable or Eric B or any of these other guys would have gotten a job if it wasn't, uh, for, you know, the rule. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that this came from the bills and not the Buccaneers, because I feel like the Buccaneers were most impacted by this right. out because they had two guys like, you know, everybody after the Super Bowl was like, well, Byron Leftwich and Todd Bowles could have gotten a job. And it's like, well, I mean, it, it's true, though, because Todd Bowles, you know, I think right. he didn't even get any interviews. And I think Byron Leftwich got one request. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, you know, at the same time, though, like how many times did the Patriots <laughs> go to the Super Bowl <laughs> and then immediately have one of their guys hired? I remember Matt, yeah. Matt Patricia got hired, you know, uh, I think during the playoffs. Right. I mean, Matt Patricia, I think, got hired by the Lions and then uh, went out of there and uh, after the Eagles Super Bowl. And, you know, then he went to the Lions, right? Josh McDaniels, I, I assume maybe a similar thing happened when he took the Denver job yeah. uh, or was thinking about taking the Colts job. Like the Patriots were in the deep playoff runs every year and they still got guys hired by other teams. So I, I just don't know if it's a broken system that needs to be fixed. Yeah, I, I think it needs to be improved, right? Because, you know, right. I think the biggest thing is that they they do need to do a better job of promoting diverse candidates. And Absolutely. You know, that is the reality of the situation. Um, and if this gets that done, like, I totally understand that. I think, you know, if you're talking about like a compromise, like wait until, you know, divisional weekend until you can hire people. I think that would be a little bit more fair. Right. Uh, you know, you get more candidates on the table there. And you're not screwing, you know, teams who are firing their coaches out of two months of an off season to get their off season started. So I don't think it will 
I don't think the rule will pass all the way until, you know, waiting until the Super Bowl to start the new lead to, to start the coaching hires. But I think it'll be pushed back, you know, a couple of weeks to at least give like wild card teams a chance to, you know, get their candidates on the table too. Right. And um, man, if they really push it all, all the way back after the Super Bowl, what are the poor uh, beat writers going to write about <laughs> their, you know, teams? Like, I know, man. Honestly. You know, the, the ones that didn't make the playoffs. Like, you know, what is, you know, it's just tough. They'll have to do some report cards like I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> some report cards on the worst position group in the <laughs> <laughs> oh man well this has been a good discussion man and so i i can't wait i'm, I'm we're so close to like getting legitimate news again you know free agency in a couple of weeks some cuts next week hopefully the draft is less than two months away which i you know i'm so excited we've been grading all these players and stuff like that um really exciting few weeks up ahead yeah no i'm, I'm excited to we'll see i guess next monday and tuesday we're gonna get some of the cuts we've already gotten some of the cuts this week so um yeah i'm excited to see what happens all right guys well that'll do it for us today thanks so much for tuning in if you're listening to us on youtube make sure you like the show subscribe leave a comment if you're listening to us on an audio platform please leave us a rating or review and as always i think this is new to our youtube listeners but we do have a sponsor which is manscaped they've been a great partner for us uh you are able to use our code guilty for 20 percent off your checkout is some great products out there. I'm a big fan of their cologne and their clothes. Their clothing line has been fantastic as well as their lawnmower to keep you guys looking your best every single day of the week. So again, that's the code guilty at checkout for 20% off. And uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Just like NFL teams are cutting players, you can cut that hair off your balls. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys.